Okay, so I think we're right on time. Um, so I'm going to start by acknowledging uh, that I'm talking to you here today um, from the land of the Wajuk Noongar people, and I'd like to pay my respect to their elders, past and present. So welcome everybody to um, the archaeology seminar series um, here at UWA. Uh, we are nearing the end of our series for this semester, but there'll be more um, next semester. And we still have three more talks coming in. Um, just a quick announcement. Uh, next week, we're going to have a discussion um, between people in geography and archaeology here in the School of Social Sciences at UWA um, around climate change. So I invite uh, everybody to come, especially people who are in Perth to actually come in person because we should be able to now. Um, and meet in the room to have a, a, hopefully a lively discussion. Uh, I was going to do a bit of uh, advertisement for our fantastic department about everything that happened, but actually there's been really a lot happening in the last week. So I encourage everybody to go and look at our social media pages on Facebook and Twitter, and actually go and look at all the nice publications and field work that are going on at the moment, okay? Um, I need to do a little um, advertisement as well that um, we are recording this talk. So everybody uh, participating in the discussion at the end and also sending chat messages, even if you're sending it to me privately, uh, they will be recorded, so just be aware, okay? And with all of this, it is now my great pleasure to um, introduce Emery Kerman uh, and Mary Wellworth we're going to talk to us about the result of a um, collaborative project um, between archaeology and linguistic to look at the integration of Polynesian communities in central Vanuatu. So Emery Kerman um, is a Pacific archaeologist at the Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique in Paris and research associate at the Max Planck Institute in Jena. And this research uh, that uh, they're going to present to us today is part of his current involvement on projects that are looking at the settlement history of Polynesia and Polynesian outliers. And Mary Walworth is currently the lead um, of the Comparative Oceanic Linguistics Research Group at the Max Plant as well. Um, and she's also an affiliate at the ARC Center of Excellence for the Dynamic of Language here in Australia. And uh, part of her research, um, as presented today, focuses on the evolution of oceanic languages and the historical relationships between these languages. So over to you guys. I'm going to stop sharing so that you can share. Oh, and while you're doing that, everybody, please, if I could ask you to um, be on mute and turn off your um, cameras during the talk, and then we can all come back online for the end. Okay. So, um, shall I start? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, we're gonna, yeah. Um, hi, hi everybody. So we are going to talk um, to you today about the, uh, yeah, the, as Emily said, about the work that um, sort of like an introduction uh, or pre 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 preliminary res um, results from our work in, in Central Vanuatu that we started in 2018. Well, a bit earlier, yeah, yeah I guess yeah. you started earlier, Mary. Um, and I joined uh, the Max Planck team in, in 2018 uh, and, and started work on, on, on the outliers of Central Vanuatu. And uh, yeah, we realized quickly that, um, um, as I'm going to explain right after, that the outliers of Central Vanuatu are a complex sort of topic and difficult to address. Um, uh only on on archaeological grounds so uh we we decided to to sort of uh, synthesize the, the kind of data that's already out there in the literature um so that's pretty much what we're going to talk about today um uh, a quick outline uh yeah i'm going to present quickly the 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 uh the polynesian outliers uh, as a as a whole the uh, the approach the uh, sort of approach that we took that we in inspired from from uh, Pat Kirch and Roger Green's um, uh, triangulation approach on, on the on the Polynesian um, ancestral society of Polynesia. Uh, then Mary's going to describe at length uh, just a, a subset of of the results of the uh, the linguistic evidence for um, 
borrowings from the Polynesian languages to the central Vanuatu languages, and uh, on the other hand, uh, borrowings from from um, the uh, the central Vanuatu languages to to the to the Polynesian outlier languages of the region. Uh, and then um, I'll talk about what that means in terms of uh, cultural exchange and um, try to outline what that means also for archaeologists uh, when they want to identify a signature for the Polynesians, the Polynesian arrival in, in the region. So uh, quickly, the Polynesian outliers are um, these Polynesian communities that are settled in the Western Pacific outside of the Polynesian Triangle, which is why we call them outliers, or people have called them outliers. Um, the, um, they, they're, they're settled pretty much in every archipelago of the Western Pacific uh, in, um, in the outskirts of, of, of these um, huge archipelagos um, in around 20 lo localities. <clears throat> The chronology of, of the of this settlement is quite remains unclear in most places, apart from a few outliers that were investigated archaeologically uh, in starting in the 70s, uh, especially Ticopia with Pat Kirch's work, and um, uh, early on Nukuoro with uh, Janet Davidson's work, and uh, and then right after Kapinga Marangi by Fosleach and and Taumako by Janet Davidson and Fosleach. Uh, so apart from that, um, the southern outliers of, of Vanuatu uh, were investigated by um, by the Shuttlers, uh, who also excavated on Ifira Island in the in the uh, uh, Port Vila Harbor, and uh, Mike Carson also did his PhD on on Uvea um, Uvea in, in uh, Loyalty Islands, but but even though uh, you know most of these places were excavated uh, early on and, and um, it is always very difficult to, to, to tell in the, in, the, in the cultural sequence what is Polynesian and what isn't. So uh, that's, a, that's a, a recurring problem. Um, it is not a, an homogeneous uh, cultural unit like um, Western Polynesia, for example, or Central Eastern Polynesia. Um, it is quite diverse in, in many uh, aspects. And um, also another um, typical uh, thing in the outliers is um, intense relationships between uh, the Polynesian outlier communities and their, uh, their, na their neighbors. Um, so, and finally, uh, obviously these, these outliers are um, identified mainly through uh, linguistic and ethnographic data since the early 20th century, um, but the archaeological investigation is, is much uh, later, as I described. We can uh, imagine or we can reconstruct uh, preliminarily, so to speak, um, different possible settlement histories in the outliers. Um, most of them are settled um, since the, the Lapita period, at the same time than uh, the other islands of the Western Pacific. Although that might not be the case for the northern outliers, um, we don't really know much about these, except for uh, Nukuoro and Kapigamarangi, which um, can be represented here by the, the, the sort of graph uh, A. Um, it looks like the, the settlement is quite late and could start with Polynesian settlement, but we, again, uh, it's very difficult for the archaeologists to be sure about that. Um, another possible scenario is an initial settlement by um, Lapita and their descendants, um, and then these people, um, a hiatus between this uh, occupation and the Polynesian arrival. That uh, could be the case for Anuta and Tikopia. Um, then a third sort of uh, scenario is um, the initial settlements uh, of Lapita peoples and their descendants, um, this population lasting until the Polynesian arrives, uh, these people could, you know, live next to each other, um, you know, mix and everything. And then um, that produces sort of like a, um, a sort of mixed Polynesian sort of identity that lasts until European contact. Um, that's, that is certainly the case for Renel and Bellona. 
uh, and, and Telmaco. And uh, the, the last kind of scenario is, is more what, what happens in, in the southern outliers of, of Vanuatu and the Loyalty Islands, where uh, the Polynesian, when the Polynesians arrive, they, they're surrounded by um, non Polynesian populations that are descendants from the Lapita and, and their descendants. And they, they mix and they, uh, they stay in, in, in very uh, sort of uh, intense contact uh, until European arrival. Um, these scenarios, these scenarios uh, have to be considered along with inter-island uh, interactions and, and possibly, um, certainly through all traditions, we know inter-outliers inter Polynesian migrations. For example, there's lots of context um, between Taumako uh, and Tikopia. Uh, a line of chiefs in Tikopia is called Taumako. Um, the, outlier, the northern outliers, they, they, they they have many contacts between them, between uh, Luang Iwa, uh, known as uh, Ontong Java, and, and Nukuoro, Kapinga Marangi, Taku, and so on. Um, so, uh, um, understanding the origins, uh, the historical tra trajectories, uh, similarities, and differences between um, these Polynesian outliers uh, implies a kind of research that, that goes far beyond uh, Polynesian archaeology, of course. Um, because these populations um, settled in regions that are culturally dense and, and diverse, uh, and because most of them show signs of, of sustained relationships uh, with their neighbors, these cultural units can, can all be considered unique. Investigating the, the, Polynesian, um, the Polynesian outliers history, therefore means looking at the whole Oceania at once, um, uh, as one could say. In, in crystallized forms that vary depending on the cultural heritage of, uh, of each community and specific intercultural uh, contexts. More than anywhere else in, in Oceania, the history of the outliers relates um, as much to internal and vertical processes of change as it relates to external and uh, horizontal processes of contact. Um, these photos show the diversity of the, the outliers' populations, um, who are typically mixed uh, populations between Polynesians and, and Western Pacific peoples. Um, so today we're going to talk about Central Vanuatu. Here are our photos, early photos of, of uh, population of the population, the communities uh, of uh, Ifila, or known as Ifira, in the in the Polvila Arbor of, of Ifate, um, Emai. Um, in the Shefford Island and, um, and the Mele Islet with uh, also a settlement on the mainland of Fati um, uh, at the bottom. So before um, reconstructing and dating the uh, cultural sequence of the outliers, one must be able to unambiguously uh, establish what is of Polynesian origin, what isn't. Um, unfortunately, apart from geochemical sourcing, uh, and that we'll, uh, we'll talk about uh, quickly after, and uh, new genetic, uh, archaeogenetic studies that are currently in progress, the archaeological remains did not yet uh, provide convincing evidence um, for, for, for that kind of information yet. Therefore, uh, an integrated multidisciplinary approach, like the one uh, of historical um, anthropology, uh, seems uh, to be the best way to explain present and past um, cultural expression in, in the uh, outliers and to, rec to reconstruct these, uh, these specific historical trajectories. So just like the, the others before us, and, and to quote linguist Andrew Pauly, we believe that for doing cultural history, several disciplines are ultimately better than one. The wealth of the linguistic and ethnographic record in the outliers enable, enables the, the same kind of uh, triangulation approach that the one developed by, by Kirch and Green in, uh, in the reconstruction of the ancestral Polynesian society. That is um, a comparative analysis of linguistic forms combined with an assessment of the uh, semantic value based on uh, the ethnographic record and, if available, on the archaeological record. This approach is, is ambitious uh, and requires expertise in, in different scientific fields and bring together um, inferences from, from different kinds of data. And um, well, that's why we, we focused on, on, a, on a very uh, small region, uh, which is where we work, but also because it requires a lot of work to, to go through all this kind of data. 
The idea behind the triangular approach is to analyze different kinds of data separately, following the methodological principles of, his, of each discipline. And then, uh, as a second step, put things in perspective, um, which leads to confirming and constraining the results. Uh, so all of that is, is explained in, um, at length by, by Kirch and Green in, uh, in, their, in their 2001 volume uh, for Hawaii, which is very famous among uh, oceanic archaeologists. For the rest of the talk, we're, we're going to focus on, on central Vanuatu um, and uh, how this kind, of, uh, this, this kind of approach allows us to, to identify the, the origin of uh, cultural practices in this region. What is, uh, what is typical in central Vanuatu is a, a difficulty to associate specific items, traditions, institutions to either a local or Polynesian source. Um, and uh, using the comparative method of historical linguistics uh, that, that helps disentangle the roots uh, of this mixed cultural sphere. Now I'll let Mary talk. Um, so uh, the next sort of portion of the talk is uh, based on this paper that we wrote that's um, about this preliminary study for the outliers in central Vanuatu. So that's shown here. And then all of the, the data, I'm just going to eventually give you sort of snippets of some of our data, um, some of the linguistic comparisons. Um, but all of the data is available here at the bottom of this slide um, on Zenodo. Um, so you can access that. And of course, if you read French, you can also access the, the paper here. So linguistically, uh, central Vanuatu is a small area that has actually a lot of different languages. So here we find three Polynesian language varieties, uh, Fakamai, which is spoken uh, in three communities on Imai Island, which is right here on this island here. Um, Imere language, which is spoken um, on uh, in Meli village, I think as Enric mentioned, and historically is, was also spoken on uh, Meli Island, which is you know here in uh, off of Fate. And then we have Fila language, um, which is spoken on historically on Efira Island, which is just off of Port Vila, uh, on again on Afate. Um, these two languages, Ifira and Mele, are often considered as one language because they are quite close, um, but they, there are some differences that can be accounted for between them, and historically, um, they, they were a bit more separate. Um, but during the talk, you'll hear us refer to them as Ifira and Mele, um, because that's how they are more often analyzed. Um, there are four non-Polynesian Vanuatu languages um, spoken in central Vanuatu as well. So we have Nakanamanga, which is spoken across the region uh, throughout North Afate, um, also on a Mai island, um, right alongside of the Fakamai speakers, um, on uh, Tongua, and uh, up until South Epi, which is up here. Um, then there's also Namakura, which is spoken sort of in the East Islands uh, of Central Vanuatu, notably including Makura Island here, where it's Na Makura from Makura. Uh, and finally, Lelepa, um, Lelepa language spoken on Lelepa Island here off of the north of Afate. So these languages are, now I'm going to give you a bit of a tutorial on uh, the, the placement of these languages and uh, then we'll get into the historical linguistics part. Uh, but these languages are all uh, oceanic languages, so they're descendants of the same mother language, which is Proto-Oceanic. But the Polynesian languages are, are more like distant cousins to the neighbor languages in central Vanuatu. So here, <clears throat> the, I sh you sh see sort of a, a condensed uh, oceanic tree, um, but the oceanic subgroup of, of languages has many branches, as you can see here. And um, while Polynesian languages and Vanuatu languages both descend from Proto-Oceanic, they're part of separate branches, as hopefully you can tell here. Um, so the Vanuatu languages are part of the Southern Oceanic uh, sort of branch. Um, and the central Vanuatu languages are part of another part of that fork, which under uh, proto-north central Vanuatu, um, which is, of course, a group within Southern Oceanic. There we go, there's my cursor. Um, the Polynesian languages descend from proto-Polynesian um, under the central Pacific branch. So these languages all reflect the unique innovations of their respective lower level proto-languages 
Proto-Polynesian in the case of the Polynesian languages and Proto-North Central Vanuatu for the uh, Central Vanuatu languages. Sometimes, however, because they are distantly related under Proto-Oceanic, um, these languages have independently undergone similar changes as well. So as a historical linguist, we have to kind of take into account different aspects of the language system in order to understand what is truly directly inherited um, from a proto-language and what is indirectly inherited. So what is um, contact induced and sometimes, as we say, borrowed. So how do we identify borrowings, the fun part? So for this study, borrowings uh, from Polynesian languages into central Vanuatu languages um, were based on identifying proto-Polynesian innovations in the central Vanuatu languages. And these are innovations of three kinds. So we have lexical innovations, where an entirely new word uh, found in a central Vanuatu language is one that can only be reconstructed to the Polynesian proto-language, proto-Polynesian, and uh, is not part of any proto-language of central Vanuatu languages. Second, we have phonological innovations. So where the phonological form, the, the sort of condensed sound segments, the form of sounds um, of a central Vanuatu word reflects the sound a sound change that is uniquely um, identified for a Polynesian language. Um, or sometimes we can see this as it, um, a reflection of the sound changes that are observed in the Polynesian languages that are in central Vanuatu. So if, they, if these two Polynesian languages have undergone an additional change from Proto-Polynesian, and then that same sound is evidenced in a form in a central Vanuatu language, that's a pretty good indication that it's, it's borrowed uh, Polynesian form. Then finally, we have semantic innovations where um, there's a meaning change within a central Vanuatu word that reflects a semantic change uh, or semantic innovation from Proto-Polynesian, or again, a semantic innovation that is found in the Polynesian languages of central Vanuatu. The, identif the identification of central Vanuatu borrowings into the Polynesian languages on the other side um, is similarly based on phonological features that are found in central Vanuatu languages, but are not typically found in Polynesian languages and were not present in Proto-Polynesian. Um, and in, a, in addition to the uh, lexical, phonological, and semantic innovations of the central Vanuatu languages. So in sum, to kind of recap, we're looking for three things when we're doing this kind of work. We're looking for unexpected sound changes. So where a form uh, in a language does not follow the established sound changes from its uh, respective proto-language um, or its own internal sound rules. So for example, um, we have the sound p in Proto-Oceanic shown here, um, which underwent two different kind of changes in two, these two different proto-languages. -language, it became v or v in Proto-North Central Vanuatu, but it became f in Proto-Polynesian. So we'd expect these languages that descend from these two proto-languages to do things differently. Um, second, we're looking for lexical innovations where a completely new word was innovated in a particular proto-language, but not in another. So for example, uh, a proto of a, of a lexical innovation is proto-Polynesian mori um, to uh, offer, um, to, oh, we have that in French here, to offer or an offering. Um, and it, so we can see that since this is an innovation in proto-Polynesian, it can only be sort of inherited, directly inherited by Polynesian, other Polynesian languages. And then third, we're looking for shared semantic uh, changes. And this comes in the form of semantic innovation and usually um, in an extension or sort of a precision of the older meaning. So for example, linguists are able to reconstruct the word toki uh, for Proto-Oceanic, for proto um, meaning to cut. And then Proto-Polynesian, we see that um, in Proto-Polynesian, the same form has been kept but there's been a change in meaning to mean um, ads. So using these principles in this, in this study on central Vanuatu, we compared word lists and grammatical descriptions of um, all of these languages that were written by missionaries, ethnographers, and linguists sort of throughout the history of um, after European contact in this region. Um, in the, so these date from the end of the 19th century um, to more modern, modern sources, of course, like Nick Tiberger's work on um, Nafsan. Um, and significant data actually came from uh, multiple unpublished manuscripts, uh, which were provided by Jean-Claude Rivière, 
um, before his death in 2018, and graciously by Ross Clark, both of whom did a lot of work, um, just didn't have time to quite get it out there and publish it, but they did a lot of work in multiple communities in these areas. So through this, we found lots and lots of borrowings, lots and lots of loans in both directions um, and across multiple semantic domains. So in the next few slides, I'll try to bear with me, you know, while I try to kind of walk you through some of the specific examples um, going domain by domain. And here again, I, I'll be focusing on the different ways that we analyzed um, the loans and figured out how if these were loans. Um, and then after, Emric will kind of situate it in, in the cultural context. So starting with loans from Polynesian languages into the central Vanuatu languages uh, and starting with the physical environment. Um, we'll, we've got a few here. I've just got two examples. I'll start first with the easy one, which is actually uh, second on the list. Um, it's easy because we see that there's been an innovation in Proto-Polynesian uh, for Univolve. Um, so it's easy to see that this has been borrowed into um, Nakanamanga and Nafsan. Turtle, however, is a little bit more difficult to see at first glance. Um, but when we inspect the regular sound changes in these, in these languages here, we see that um, indeed this is a borrowing from the Polynesian form. Um, so to sort of elaborate on that, um, we would expect in the non-Polynesian languages, we would expect sort of va or wa um, uh, in the first, for the first consonant. Um, of turtle if they were directly descendant from the proto-oceanic form. But what we see is that we find F um, throughout. And so these F forms can then be determined to be loans from the Polynesian languages. Second, looking at um, navigation. Again, we'll start with the easy one here. In this case, surf, which is uh, seke, um, which is a Polynesian uh, innovation. Um, found in here in the non-Polynesian languages of Namakura and Nafsan. Um, for mast, we see similar forms again for Proto-Oceanic and Proto-Polynesian, but again, based on what we know these languages to do regularly, their regular sound changes, we would not expect to see a T there in the first consonant, but it's there, um, demonstrating that it's alone from the Polynesian languages. Finally, we have kind of an unusual and, and a little bit difficult case with um, canoe, canoe type, type of canoe, this rarua. Here we found attestations of this compound of sail and tu um, to mean a kind of canoe in all of the non-Polynesian languages of central Vanuatu. And so these two components, well, while the components can be reconstructed to both Proto-Oceanic and Proto-Polynesian, the, the form together, the compound, uh, has not been reconstructed for any of these proto-languages. Then on top of that, the forms in the central Vanuatu languages don't do what's expected of them if these were directly inherited from, from proto-oceanic or proto-north central Vanuatu. Um, and they actually do what we would expect of a Polynesian language. But at the same time, we don't find this compound in the Polynesian languages of central Vanuatu. So we thought, well, maybe this is a Polynesian borrowing from somewhere else that's not in central Vanuatu. And indeed, we find the same compound in the um, southern Vanuatu outlier of Fatuna Iniwa. So what this does is it shows us that this is indeed a borrowing, uh, a Polynesian borrowing into the central Vanuatu languages, but it points to um, sort of an expanded cultural uh, sphere, contact sphere between central Vanuatu and the southern Vanuatu outliers. And so this might be indicative of some sort of uh, historical cohesion between also the Polynesian outliers of central Vanuatu and uh, south Vanuatu. Moving on to material culture, so looking at artifacts and ornaments here. Um, here we see a Polynesian innovative necklace, Kasua, um, found in at least one uh, central Vanuatu language. Uh, and the Polynesian uh, innovated sleeping mat, um, Mohena, nga, uh, which is literally sleeping place uh, in another, in Nakanamanga. Um, and then finally, we have cloth or mesh made from a, a fiber at the base of a coconut frond. And this also appears to be a Polynesian borrowing into the central Vanuatu languages. But in this case, we came across kind of another uh, obstacle. Um, because a similar form can be reconstructed to Proto-Oceanic. So it's difficult to see if 
the presence in the central Vanuatu languages is indirect borrowed or if it's direct. Um, but for this form, the only other attestation or instance of this word in any oceanic language was found, uh, is found in a language called Patpatar, which is um, well north of Vanuatu. Um, so for us, this, this form is not found in any other Vanuatu language. It's not really found in any other oceanic language, um, but it is very Polynesian looking and is very prominent in the Polynesian languages of this area. So on sort of distributional grounds, we can say that this form in central Vanuatu is more, is more likely borrowed um, and indirectly inherited from the Polynesian languages here. Um, looking now at social organization. So we found many Polynesian loans in central Vanuatu that relate to uh, social organization and in particular kind of the offerings that must be given to a higher chief. And here we see the clear proto-Polynesian innovation to offer as I discussed before in the central Vanuatu languages. We also see some Proto-Polynesian innovative terms that have expanded meaning uh, in, the Proto in the Polynesian languages of central Vanuatu. These forms and their semantic innovations have clearly, um, are clearly also present in, in the non-Polynesian languages of central Vanuatu as well. So we have Kainanga, um, which in Proto-Polynesian uh, meant a land holding group tracing ascent from a common ancestor. And this shifted meaning into central Vanuatu to mean something more like a group of people subordinate um, to a certain chief. And then we have Sao Tonga, which is another great one, um, which is compounded, uh, meaning a tribute to a higher chief by a subordinate chief, which appears also to be a compounded form of the Proto-Polynesian forms, Sao, which is gift or tribute, and Tounga, which is valuables. So now moving to the, to the other direction, we'll look at um, the central Vanuatu loans found in the Polynesian languages of central Vanuatu. Um, and bear with me with just a few more examples uh, before Emrit gets into the, the real archeological cultural stuff. Um, we've uh, found a few examples of non-Polynesian words for artifact, uh, for different artifacts found in the Polynesian languages. So these examples here are all really easy, nice ones. Um, and they show instances where there's no reconstructable form for Proto-Polynesian um, and they're not found in other Polynesian languages. So there's really no question that the forms here in the Polynesian languages of central Vanuatu have been borrowed from the local central Vanuatu languages. So here we have fishhook, um, karao, which is a giant clam adds, um, and bolo, which is a basket made of coconut leaves. Furthermore, we see a shared semantic change from just hook to fish hook in the central Vanuatu languages that also extends, um, we see it extending as well to the uh, Polynesian languages. Keeping with material culture, but now moving to sort of more ornaments, we also found several instances of loan words um, relating to ornamentation, both the ornaments themselves and the, the sources of the ornaments, so to speak. So the ornaments themselves, we have bati, which is circular pig tusk bracelet, lala, which is, um, um, a truckus shell bracelet and bani, which is a shell armband. Um, and then the source of the ornaments would be, uh, an example of this would be in liwo, um, which is the pig that grows uh, circular tusks. So here again, we find clear non-Polynesian words in the Polynesian languages. And we also see that there's, again, some shared semantic change between the central Vanuatu languages from their proto languages that is also attested in these Polynesian forms. So for example, liwo, um, pig with circular tusks comes from proto north central Vanuatu tooth um, and armband comes from proto north central Vanuatu arm wing or armlet. So we see sort of a, a bit of an extension semantically. Um, finally, uh, we, we show evidence of numerous loans into the Polynesian languages uh, in the domain of social organization. Some of these are kinship terms. For example, here we see proto north central Vanuatu aloa undergoing a semantic shift in the central Vanuatu languages from nephew or sister's child um, to becoming mo mother's brother. And this same meaning and form is found in, in both of the Polynesian outlier languages. Turning to public and political spaces, um, an interesting example of borrowing arises in uh, the term fare, where we find evidence of dynamic and layered borrowing between the Polynesian and non-Polynesian languages, um, which is indicative of the complex and continuous exchanges over time. 
So here, the central Vanuatu languages inherited um, sort of the semantic value, the meaning of two different words from Proto North Central Vanuatu, building and public space. And these have merged with the Proto Polynesian inherited meaning of household in the Polynesian Melifila language. But then simultaneously, the Me in Melifila, there appears to be a sort of reinterpretation of the form of the word, of the sounds of the word. Um, which has clearly been borrowed um, from the non-Polynesian languages in the area. So you get sort of in one form, in one word, you see this really clear kind of back and forth exchange between them, which is cool. Um, continuing on to public space, um, or continuing on this notion of public space, we see the non-Polynesian attested Kamali borrowed into Fakamai from the central Polynesian languages. Another less obvious example is where some of the central Vanuatu languages have innovated a term uh, mualala um, for dancing ground or sort of central public place in a village. Um, and this such form is not found in any Polynesian languages. Uh, and additionally, we see non-Polynesian sounds in the Polynesian form here, this mua. So we can definitely tell that this is a borrowing uh, into the Polynesian language. Finally, and it is the last one, but it is an important one, we have mala. Um, so this word is reconstructed, uh, reconstructable to proto-north central Vanuatu as bird, uh, bird of prey, um, and also high grade or chiefly title. But among the central Vanuatu languages, we see a clear shift in meaning to leader or the act of leading. And this same meaning is found in the Polynesian languages that test, attest to this non-Polynesian form. So now I'll hand it back over to Emrick, who can tell you what that all means. I can certainly try. Um, <clears throat> so um, in terms of um, what, uh, what that means um, for culturally speaking and historically speaking, uh, we um, um, I'll, uh, I'll start with the, the last form that uh, Mary discussed, uh, which is uh, Mala. Um, that tells us an interesting thing uh, because we can trace back to um, Malakula, Santo, and other northern Vanuatu um, islands. This, this term uh, used for the, the higher grade in a grade taking system um, that is obviously not a Polynesian thing, but um, it is present in central Vanuatu uh, uh, as sort of like the, the root of, um, of this concept of, of leadership. So uh, possibly the, the, the political organization of, of central Vanuatu um, is based on decentralized leadership. There's a group of, of people ruling rather than one. Uh, and uh, that, you know, it originates in, in apparently in the great taking system or a form of great taking system uh, in North Vanuatu. Um, uh, certain colleagues have told me that, uh, Matthew Spriggs uh, told me that uh, it's the great taking system as we know it in, in North Vanuatu is probably not um, uh, more ancient than the 15th century because of the, the sites that um, are, are used for these this great taking ceremonies. Um, but a form of, of that kind of, of system is, is probably older, I imagine. Along with that, uh, the introduction of the um, uh, very Polynesian Kainanga in, in, in central Vanuatu shows that the, uh, the Polynesian brought the, uh, the idea of a, of a political integration of, of smaller uh, residential units. So uh, we posit that this, this two way borrowing is at the origin of the, of the chiefly title system uh, that is described, uh, that was described at length by uh, ethnographer Jean Guillard in this, in this book that is not read by many people and certainly not by English speaking um, scholars, um, but that describes very precisely how this uh, original chiefly title, this chiefly system uh, works. Um, as Mary mentioned, the uh, all languages of central Vanuatu have a term um, for canoe, a large canoe that is made of uh, Polynesian loans. Although none of the Polynesian languages in the region have similar terms. So this indicates that there is another source for, for the loans and that there are multiple layers of, of Polynesian settlements in central Vanuatu. Um, 
So uh, now it's 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 quite clear uh, what the term. It's it's not quite clear what the terms uh, Rarua and Nararu uh, refer to exactly in Central Vanuatu. Um, it, it, the compound is sail and two. So is it um, a canoe with two sails, two two masts? Uh, is it a canoe uh, with a two spare two spar spritz tail? Um, this is an open question, um, and there are two possibilities uh, in my mind. Um, the um, the nearest outliers of, of Futuna Naniwa, as, as Mary said, in in, uh, in southern Vanuatu, have the word drarua, which means two masted canoe, uh, and I put here the, this image from uh, from Hodges, uh, this uh, this engraving uh, from uh, New Caledonia uh, of, of these canoes with two with two masts and two sails. Um, now there's also um, uh, the uh, hypothesis of two sparse spritz tail that is described by uh, Andy Piazza for um, uh, northern Vanuatu and and, um, and several outliers in the, in the north. Um, uh, so this this so-called butterfly sail um, could have been uh, borrowed from the uh, nearby uh, Polynesian outliers of Tikopia and Anuta, which are known from ethnographic and archaeological sources to have contacts with the Banks uh, Islands uh, in northern Vanuatu. Now turning to a possible archaeological signature of uh, Polynesians in the uh, in the outliers. I'll start with stone edges, which is uh, typically the, the, the key item to identify Polynesian settlements. Um, my, my geochemical sourcing project will be published soon, so I'm not going to elaborate uh, on this here. Uh, so I'll, uh, I'll only say that uh, in my and Tauma co edges, um, stone edges can be, can be sourced to uh, the same place in Samoa, and that Polynesian hands have made other stone edges uh, that we found in Emai that are, are made of local material but are typically of, of Polynesian style. And this is uh, related to the word, I imagine, to the word toki, which is uh, present everywhere in Polynesia to, to describe edzes. Um, shell shell edzes, uh, also possibly a good proxy to identify Polynesian migrations in, in the region. Uh, it's a bit more difficult because these are um, not um, as easy to associate to Polynesians, um, uh, but we we have identified this this item this uh, this form Kalea uh, descending from Polynesian Kalea Karea Kareo um, uh, in in uh, central Vanuatu that uh, is used to to identify univalve shellfish. Um, so uh, the introduction of a Polynesian term for univalve shells is interesting when when edzes uh, made of uh, Mitridae and Terebridae are only associated with, with the last millennium AD in central Vanuatu and in other regions where Polynesians are also present. Uh, Tikopia, Taumako, and the neighboring uh, Santa Cruz Islands, Luangiua, uh, known as Mpong Java, and, and Bougainville Island, and on Nukuoro and the neighboring uh, Caroline Islands. The case of Fasua is, is also interesting. Um, obviously, the Polynesian the Polynesians didn't introduce the Tridacna edzes in, in Vanuatu, since these are omnipresent since since the Lapita. But one could hypothesize that they introduced um, a large ceremonial edzes, um, just like in Tikopia and and other outliers. On the left, there's this uh, this huge edz the edz that's um, made of uh, Tridacna gigas that was found uh, in in Emai. That's a bit more than 20, 25 centimeters long. And on the, on the right, the, the ritual uh, edges is collected, some of the edges is collected by uh, Raymond Firth in, in Tikopia. Uh, the forms Lele and Lele in Nakanamanga and Namakura uh, correspond to a kind of necklace of Polynesian origin that is uh, made of well, well tooth pendant. Again, just like the Rarua canoe, um, there's no reflect of Polo Polynesian lay in, um, in the uh, Polynesian languages of central Vanuatu, but a pendant that was found on Mele Islet and in Garange, um, this kind of pendants that were found um, in Garange's excavations, in, in Jose Garange's excavations in uh, Mele, Retoka, uh, Mangasi, um, and, uh, and other sites in, in the Efate region, 
confirm that this item was um, was there before uh, European contact. Uh, sorry, there again, we, we can, uh, we think that uh, this could have been introduced by um, other Polynesian populations like uh, Taumako and, and Tikopia, where uh, they are known as Rei, uh, as you can see here on the top right. Um, Kasoa, which is also a necklace or a pendant, um, might refer to pig tooth uh, beads that were uh, identified in, in burials, in recent burials as well. Um, in uh, both in the central and the south Vanuatu, uh, and these this is uh, this has been associated with the Polynesians uh, by uh, Matthew Spriggs uh, and others. And uh, what's interesting here on the uh, bottom uh, left is uh, the uh, the presence of these kind of beads in uh, the island of Anachium, which is not a Polynesian outlier, but is very close to, uh, to this hub, this cultural hub of such of South Vanuatu. Um, where Polynesian outliers are settled, and also uh, kind of close to the loyalty islands where Uvea community is settled. So to wrap it up quickly, um, the uh, so yeah, this shows that the the archaeological study of the of the outliers is a real challenge. Uh, that's why we're we're doing this work. Um, appropriately using these sources that are not material sources uh, before addressing the sort of like uh, archaeological sequence um, uh, enables us to, to, to be a bit uh, more uh, sure of what we're saying when we try to identify these, these Polynesian communities. Um, the, the work in, in Central Vanuatu um, also shows uh, how the, the cultural history in the outliers can be, can be complex because it is layered and intertwined uh, with non-Polynesian trajectories, let's say oceanic trajectories in general. Um, and well, we don't have time to talk about it here, but the chiefly tidal system in central Vanuatu is quite unique and is uh, likely a, a reflection of that kind of um, sort of mixed cultural sphere. And obviously uh, this region is uh, sort of more than at the border, it sort of like goes beyond the the, the Polynesia Malaysia divide. So that's also quite exciting to uh, it's a quite ex it's an exciting place to work because it's it's so uh, so unique and so so uh, so interesting. Thank you for your attention. Epalasi. Epalasi, as they <laughs> say in mind. Thank you very much. And I can ask everybody now to um, turn on their cameras and uh, microphone if they want to take part in the discussion and ask questions. Um, so while I'm waiting for people to put their hands up, uh, maybe if you can stop sharing so we can see all the faces so I can actually see when someone put their hands up. Because <laughs> otherwise it's going to be really difficult. Um, do you think, okay, it's a tricky question, okay. Do you think then um, that the material culture items that you've identified um, as um, maybe specific borrowings uh, from Polynesian languages um, could then be used to trace archeologically the presence of um, Polynesian groups? Yeah, I, I mean, um... Yeah, I think that it's it's interesting that uh, especially for the shallots is um, you know some people like Garanger early on people have said you know univalve uh, edges, uh, univalve shellfish edges are you know quite recent. They they the origin for this kind of tradition is is not quite clear. So people have said that they might come from Micronesia. They, they are present everywhere in in, in the Western Pacific, but um, yeah, it's, it, it appears quite late, it's late. Um, the, the directionality is, is not quite sure. And so we, we now like the, uh, the strength of, of historical linguistics is to have this sort of like systematic comparative approach. Um, and archeologists are always dealing with problems of, uh, you know, sample size. We, we don't have everything at hand. Uh, not everything is well dated, so the directionality is, is a bit difficult, but, but uh, the sort of linguistic uh, evidence is, you know, 
quite compelling here. Um, I wouldn't say that everywhere where we find univalve shellfish heads is they are all Polynesians, but um, it is it is compatible to the idea that the Polynesians introduced that in central Vanuatu is compatible with what we know of um, what we you know can can sort of the vision, the vision that we have of the, the, the length of the cultural sequence with, uh, you know, genealogies and oral traditions talking about, you know, Polynesian arrival um, as early as the, you know, the ninth century AD and the, 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 the sort of the dates that are going to be published soon are also compatible with that uh, for, for, um, individuals that have, uh, Polynesian genetic ancestry. So it, the, the, the sort of image, uh, is, is, um, is of the Polynesian arrivals in central Vanuatu and South Vanuatu is, is coming from different places, different sources. So we, that's our contribution for now. Thank you. Um, anyone putting their hands up for a question? I'm trying to have a look at everybody. Oh. Music. <laughs> Timer. <laughs> no questions about the, the methodology. You're all expert historical linguists now. You can go out and do it yourself, I guess. Yeah, I understood <laughs> everything. Yes, Anne-Marie, yes? Yes, thank you very much. I, I really like this talk a lot and I loved all the, all the pictures of the stuff that you guys put. I think that was really quite telling, especially because oftentimes you don't know these particular cultural objects, right? Uh, so I think my question, maybe Imerick just started answering it. Um, my question would be, do you have an idea of the linguistic time death of Polynesian and Central Vanuatu contact? Um, because you, you said that the archaeological time death is a bit hard because some objects are not dated. And then you have the, you have the genetic component. So could you, could you elaborate a little bit on, on each of the time death provided or published or kind of gut feelings um, for all three of these disciplines? And if they match up, that will be my, that will be my question. Yeah, I mean, it looks so I guess we can't say too much because it's not published yet, but stay tuned, hopefully in the next month <laughs> um, for a nice phylo dated phylogeny. Um, but uh, yeah, it looks to be um, around the same time that we would expect, I guess, um, for these three disciplines. I'm not sure from, I guess the genetics is coming to, the archeology span is coming soon and the linguistics is all coming, should all be out this year. Um, do you want to talk about the exact kind of dates or, I mean, the, the, so the arrival of the Polynesians is, I guess we can say probably around what? So, uh, yeah, 1100? What, yeah, what we can say for sure is that, uh, the, the, there are Polynesian communities in, in, uh, in Mai, um, around the, the time that uh, the, the Kauai, the, uh, the, the gigantic sort of volcanic uh, eruption of, of Kauai in, in north cent central Vanuatu uh, erupt happened, uh, which is the, you know, 1450 something, maybe a bit earlier, maybe a bit later. Um, so they are there for sure at that time. Um, but as, you know, as, as we mentioned, there's a, there was people there before, um, because you know, on, based on the linguistic evidence, we can see that you know there was there was contact with other uh, Polynesian sources before that. Um, what else? Yeah. Um, so yeah, sometimes during the, the the first half of the of the last millennium, um, these, these these populations are surely uh, you know navigating from from West Polynesia to to, to the Western Pacific. Um, yeah, there, there's there's uh, the, the phylogeny of Polynesian languages that Mary's uh, publishing soon that also has its take on the chronology, um, the, uh, yeah, the genetic data. The thing is that um, just like for the triangulation approach, everything is a bit triangulation approach in a way if, if everybody's working in, in their own disciplines and we need to have everybody's sort of take on, on this before we can sort of 
try to uh, calibrate the the uh, sort of scenario. So um, yeah, it's yeah. to to not be too ambiguous. I hope that wasn't too ambiguous. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else? I'm Etienne Bata, population geneticist in, in Paris. Just to complement what Emmerich said, uh, we recently dated um, a mixture, genetic admixture between uh, Polynesian uh, ancestors and uh, um, populations who traditionally live in, in Vanuatu. And the date is around 1,200, 1,000 years ago. But that's admixture, not arrival, right? Mm -hmm. That's all. Thank, Just thank you, yeah. Interesting. Thank you for sharing that. No problem. So yeah, it looks like everything's kind of around. <laughs> all of the disciplines are lining up, even if we're not directly yeah. working together yet. And so while I'm waiting to see um, other hands rising, uh, just to make it really clear, uh, because I did understand everything, but maybe not everything, Marie. <laughs> um, when you're talking about Polynesian borrowings, um, are you referring directly to the Polynesian languages that are being spoken today in central Vanuatu, or could that be Polynesian borrowings from languages that are spoken in Western Polynesia, for example? Um, is that what's so the, exactly Polynesian? Yeah, so I think for most of these, for most of our examples and most of our data, it's via the Polynesian borrowings are via the Polynesian languages that are spoken in central Vanuatu. Um, we have a couple of those examples with the necklace, the whale tooth necklace yeah. and with um, the rarua, um, and there are a few others in, in our data set um, that aren't present in, in the central Vanuatu languages uh, the central Poly the Polynesian languages spoken in central Vanuatu, um, but we do find them in other kind of nearby uh, other out Polynesian outlier languages. So that suggests that either a connection between, you know, either as Emmerich said, sort of m multiple kind of waves, which is probably more correct of Polynesian. Polynesians coming from West Polynesia and ultimately maybe settling somewhere else um, or connections maybe just between these these places after after the fact um, but probably more likely this idea of you know multiple waves of Polynesians coming westward um, out of the Western Polynesia space which ultimately became Polynesian outliers that we see today. So it's, a, it's an interesting question. Actually, I didn't, it was sort of like more economic to think that uh, Polynesian loans that are coming from somewhere else than the modern languages of Central Vanuatu were coming from other outliers rather than, than West Polynesia. Most of the time, it's not possible to tell because the forms are, share the same proto, proto form uh, mm -hmm. everywhere in Polynesian languages. And so we would have to have a form that is only in West Polynesia and in no other Polynesian outliers to, to say that for sure. Now the, the oral traditions, like everywhere in, in the other uh, Polynesian outliers, mention multiple canoes coming from multiple places in Polynesia. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the, the sort of geochemical sourcing can also tell when it's well dated, when the, the artifact is well dated in a, in a sort of secure archeological context could tell also uh, things about these, these multiple waves coming from the Polynesian Triangle. Mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah. there, I mean, there is also the history of a later history of um, Samoan missionaries in, in the region. Um, so we have to you know, also consider that as a possibility that some of these are coming from Samoa. But I think uh, in at least Rarua, there's, uh, I'm, don't hold me to that. I guess I have to um, look it up after, but I'm fairly certain it's not found in Samoa. And so a way to, I guess, all of that to say a way to kind of rule out that it's, um, you know, more recent contact from this missionary period of 
Western Polynesian people coming in um, much later would be to see if it's present in, in the language that we know these people were speaking then. And then we can rule that out and say, okay, well, this looks maybe like it's a bit older. Yeah, okay. Um, I can see uh, Tihomir has his hand up. Did you want to ask a question? Uh, yes, thanks. Thanks for the interesting talk. Uh, so I'm going to ask something that's a bit outside of the scope of this particular talk, but I was wondering what is the situation like in southern Vanuatu where Aniwa and Futuna are spoken on, I mean, I mean, I think it's one language or two, whatever, but it's it's a little bit away from the other islands. So in central Vanuatu, there is a very close, like the, the Polynesian languages and the non-Polynesian languages are spoken in adjacent villages, basically, whereas in southern Vanuatu, they're quite far away. Do you have any idea what happened there or have you looked into it? Any guesses? Yeah, I mean, it, it is an interesting question. Um, and, you know, when these Polynesians were ar arriving, the ones from southern Vanuatu or into southern Vanuatu, um, there were already people there as well. I mean, today it does look like, you know, there's Polynesian language sort of spoken on one island and then non-Polynesian languages spoken further away. But um, presumably when the Polynesians arrived, they were arriving to, um, to mix in also with non-Polynesian speaking peoples, even in these places where Polynesian languages are spoken fully today. And we see a lot of evidence of of exchange um, and sort of similar cultural domains. So John Lynch has written quite a bit about this um, in terms of navigation, um, what are some of the other domains, Kaba, um, we, we, a wealth we, of, a wealth of uh, borrowing happening. Again, sort of both directions, um, yeah. We forgot to we forgot to thank uh, John Lynch, who's probably not there, no. but who you know provided lots of feedback, uh, feedback and, and, and and things. Uh, yeah, John has published. Who's a Vanuatu linguist? For those who doesn't know, who don't know him, uh, who's retired now. Um, yeah, he has published several papers about uh, uh, yeah the the the, uh, the Melanesian sort of sailing on the Polynesian Sea and things like that. The, all the vocabulary um, about the uh, sailing technology and, and marine environments are, are of Polynesian origin in, in Tana um, and, and other places in, in South Vanuatu. The uh, Aniwa, the, uh, the atoll of, of Aniwa is actually quite close to Tana. So there's lots of uh, exchange between the two places. Futuna is a bit more isolated. Um, but yeah, it's, it is a, it's definitely a hub, a cultural hub, just like Central Vanuatu. And Kava as well uh, has been hypothesized to, um, at least one variety of Kava can be possibly introduced uh, from uh, West Polynesia, um, where rather than North Vanuatu, just like the rest of Vanuatu is, is linked to more um, local sort of, um, species of cover. But yeah, John Lynch has definitely published about that. And political organizations as well. Um, the uh, bicephal sort of chiefly system of Tana uh, and, and uh, the chiefly system of Aniwa and Futuna have lots of commonalities. And, and it, it also shows just like Faria in central Vanuatu shows a lot of like back and forth reborrowing of each other's sort of ideas. Um, and so yeah, John has also published about that. And there's quite a bit of, uh, you know, connection to between the southern outliers, Futuna and Aniwa, and at least one of the, the central Vanuatu outliers, they're, they also look like they're um, related. And so there's, you know, these two spheres happening by themselves, but also probably uh, interconnected as well. Thank you. Um, I think we are nearing, I mean, we, we are actually going over it a bit, the, the hour. So um, thank you for the discussion. Oh, there's a last question here. Quick, quick question from Eva. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, just wanted to say thank you for the talk. I think it was really, really interesting. And I've got a question. Um, if I didn't get get it mixed up, you said that the word for mother's brother in the Kanamanga is Aloha. 
think we have a few different forms. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So we have, you find, can you find that? Sorry, we'll just look at our table. So we had multiple reported forms for uh, Loloa. Loloa. I think we have a Loloa, but I think it's, there's Aloa and. So for, yeah, we have Loloa, Aloa, Alo, and Loa. So all different, these are from multiple sources um, from different, and also from different varieties of Nakanamanga. So um, we'd have to look in the sort of main file to know which one belongs to which variety, but looks like there's a variety of forms as well. They say Wawa when they talk to the mother's brother. Okay. So this is very important into the Polynesian languages. Yeah. This is a local form. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And they could have, I mean, there could be more forms or it could be that, you know, it's, yeah, yeah. 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 That's Thank you very much, everybody. And uh, you can try to read the paper in French or wait for all the new publications that are coming, apparently. Uh, and thanks a lot, Emma um, and Mary, for um, giving this talk to us. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks for having us. Thanks for Bye. having us. Bye.